think my last thanks and perhaps most important thanks are to the students. Um, as you know, at Bond, it's about the student experience. And none of us would be here if it weren't for the students. Um, I'm really excited to, to hear what they have to say. And I think that if these are, are the leaders um, of tomorrow, we're in pretty good hands. Uh, just to let you know a little bit about the structure of this session, we have a total of six presenters, well, five presenters and a video. Um, each presentation, uh, they'll go in order. After each one, feel free to ask a few questions. I will have to keep um, moving us along because unfortunately we do only have the one hour. Um, and then if there's any time at the end, there will also be time for general questions. All right, the uh, presenters, and I'll, I'll introduce them in order of the presentation. There's Jessica Howe, who's in the middle there. She's the BUSA Vice President for Education. Uh, the second speaker is Avi Nayar, and he is the international postgrad student. Uh, he's studying now uh, a JD at Bond, so congratulations. Third up is Fidel Svensson. She's the International Student Liaison at BUSA. Uh, next is Jessica Covino. We have two Jessicas sitting beside each other just to make things um, interesting. And she's Academics Affairs Director. And then finally, uh, wrapping up will be the BUSA President, Jack Lynn. Okay, without further ado, I'll, um, we'll start with because one hour really isn't enough to hear the whole student voice. So um, uh, with BUSA, we've actually gone out uh, onto the Bond campus and tried to get some other voices. We have a Vox Pop video uh, where students were asked what they would like um, to tell academics and also what they thought of Bond. Smaller class sizes is like a big one. Like Teachers and like lecturers can focus a bit more on the student, like they know you personally, like they know like where you need work on, as opposed to like Griffith for example, they've got a few hundred kids in each class and it's just kind of first in, best dressed with your answers. Pretty much all the same thing, I really like how they, they know my name, like um, today my teacher George, he always calls me Danny and he says it in his American accent, which I laugh pretty much every time. Um, other things I like about Bond would be like... It's pretty, it's pretty easy to get to know everyone because it's pretty small and um, the campus is really, really nicely done. In terms of like just everyday classes and all of that, really, really good experiences, um, good, like, good relationships with all the teachers and everything like that, it's really, really good. I'm studying biomedical sciences and the opportunity that you can get, the facilities you get here at Bond, so like um, compared to other universities, you normally have labs with a maximum of 50 students and what's really good at Bond as it's really small class sizes, even in the labs they try to maximize 20 students, but there's still lab um, in charge, lab professors, so that it still counts as like maximum of 10 to 12 students per class. And everything that you actually get here at Bond and pay here at Bond, you actually get out of it as you actually get to use um, firsthand all the facilities, especially the sports arena or like the sports building in Rubina now. So it's really, really good. Uh, I really like uh, small classes where they like to mix up the location a little bit and have some outdoor classes, sometimes take it out in the sun if it's a nice day or maybe even go for a walk around campus to get the creative juices flowing. My name's Tom. Um, I've been at Bond for just over two years now, so my last semester. Um, been doing commerce, economics. Uh, class sizes are pretty small, so you know it's, it's good one-on-one -on -one interaction with the lecturers and the tutors. I uh, lived on campus for the first year, then uh, moved off. I'd highly recommend it to all students to experience the on-campus life. Best days of your life, people you meet and, you know, cherish those memories. Uh, one thing I love about being at Bond is uh, the teacher availability, so they always have time for you uh, for consultations to help you with an assignment, with an exam coming up. Uh, so hopefully they keep offering their time. I'm sure they will and that's one of the benefits I'm definitely getting in my degree uh, at Bond. Um, my experience at Bond, I think the open door policy is great uh, with the profs. You get a chance to really engage with them, take your exams to them, um, tutorial questions, everything. They're always willing to help. Um, I think that's the best part of being at Bond. 
Um, thanks, Arad. I agree with Arad completely. And I think just to add on to it, I think the architecture of this place is really beautiful um, and just the ambience around here. And I totally agree with two of these here. And I'd like to say that I'm an, I'm an international student here. So it's really, it feels like to be at home here because we have got a lot of Canadian population here. And the Bond CLSA does a really good job how diverse the student community are. So like approximately probably 30% to 40% are international students or exchange students, which is really good. Yeah, good bond. Well, I expected it to be a little bit hard and difficult trying to meet friends and kind of um, going from the high school, having a group of friends from grade eight. Um, but that wasn't the case. In week one, we pretty much made friends with everyone in our intake, which is really great. Um, I guess that's just because Bond's such a small community. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so that was, that was really cool. So it was easy. Yeah. Well, I think they're very ambitious and yeah, it's nice to be here. It's very different to my um, home university. Um, I like the small classrooms and yeah, it's a um, private feels So um, I like Shira in intercultural communications. Um, she like, gets everybody um, involved into classes and um, they, they would try to get all the names and yeah, they just like kind of a family <laughs> creating over time. The tutorials and the classes, everything is so intense, so probably trying to cover a few more, few more topics over, over, over length of three, four months would be better than just cramming up a whole lot of information in less amount of time. Um, the only thing that probably would might to improve in is more event um, there's a lot of events happening here but trying to settle in more exchange students in and trying to connect them with the local students um, unfortunately they do have a week which they enjoy and meet people from the new students but they don't have that much um, opportunity to actually meet local students that would actually know more about what's happening in Australia and the main thing I'd say is bring back the uh, no class period on Wednesdays between 12 and 2. I'm not sure if that did happen this semester, but I know for the last couple of semesters there's been some issues with that, and like that was, a, I think, a pretty important um, two hours just in the way um, for clubs and stuff to have events that they know people would be able to get to because there were no classes. Um, other than that, in terms of like around campus and stuff, um, I know there's been some problems with the Wi Fi recently. Um, I haven't necessarily personally experienced them, but um, a lot of people have commented to me. And also I live on campus and the hot water goes off pretty much every week. That's a little small thing. Um, yeah, I don't really have much, much else constructive criticism. Um, it's great. Hello, yep. <laughs> Engagement with student feedback. The second is accommodation of student needs as much as possible. And the third is outdoor learning. So um, the first, it was actually brought up at a meeting yesterday and I felt it was so important that I wanted to speak to you all about it today. Um, there can be no doubt that Bond encourages students um, to engage with lecturers and vice versa. Um, and I've been lucky enough to be part of Bursa for the last 12 months and I've had the opportunity to really see how much this university values student um, input and tries to respond to it in um, the best way possible. But I feel like that might not be the same for students who haven't been lucky enough to be in my position. Um, I don't feel that they're really seeing that feedback loop closing. And I think that that can only be achieved if our academics choose to engage with student feedback regularly and on an individual level in classrooms. 
taking the time to explain the relevance of a piece of assessment to students so that they understand how that links with their assurance of learning outcomes, how that links with what they're going to be going on to do in their careers, I think is really important because I believe that even the most unengaged students will then have a greater appreciation for why they're being asked to do this piece of assessment. I know university students are all adults and you'd hope that we would not think that you're asking us to do irrelevant pieces of, of assessment, but unfortunately, um, some students can't always see the relevance, so just explaining that might help close the feedback loop there. Going beyond assessment pieces, I think it's important to engage in feedback that you might receive as lecturers or tutors um, in the classroom, either through the class representative system or elsewise. Um, it always goes towards um, taking the time to say, look, I've heard this and I'm going to respond to it in X way and I think that this will help for Z reasons. I recognise that some feedback might be negative or it might be a little bit irrelevant in your opinion or it might not even be able to be applied that specific semester, but I think it's important that lecturers and tutors still take the time to engage with that feedback, recognise that it is there and has been given by the students and say, yeah, okay, you said constitutional law is really hard. Have you read the textbook? Have you read the constitution? If you have, have you come to my consultation hours? Okay, if you've done all of that and you're still finding it hard, perhaps you need to invest in a tutor. But if they haven't done that, it's nice to remind the students of that support that they do have available at this university um, and even encourage them to seek that support if they need it. I think that if we can all work to achieve this, we'll have a much more informed university in general and we'll also be one step closer to closing the feedback loop, which I know is something that the Vice-Chancellor is particularly concerned with and really wants to achieve, so I think that would be great. Second talking point, accommodating student needs as much as possible, is actually very close to my heart. Um, with many students at Bond striving to bring their ambition to life by engaging in much more than just their academic studies, I think it's particularly important that we are flexible with teaching arrangements and I think that to some extent that'll always be a little bit necessary. Um, I'm not suggesting that teachers need to be accommodating of every change or every rescheduling that a, that a student needs, but it is really lovely to see teachers who are more than willing to let a student swap tutorials, you know, twice throughout semester just because they have a meeting that conflicts, or if they've missed a seminar, you know, your consultation hours are there and they come and they sit down for those two hours and they say, okay, what did you go over in that seminar? Can I catch up? Okay, I feel like I, I know what you talked about now. Um, even if moving tutorials isn't an option or you know, a catch-up isn't an option, just allowing students to have the opportunity to submit the work they did do for that tutorial and go through it and provide written feedback on that, as you would with an exam answer, for example, is inherently beneficial to the student. Um, I've always deeply appreciated students who've, uh, sorry, teachers who have taken the time to read through my answers and provide feedback, because then I don't feel penalised for going above and beyond my academic studies to get the most out of my experience at Bond. Um, so, you know, for anyone who's done that for me, thank you so much. Um, accommodating student needs goes beyond this though, it also goes to exam week. Um, it's so lovely to be able to step into a lecturer's office and say, look, I've done this exam question and then just say, you know, great, awesome, it's six pages long but why don't we try and go through as much as we can and just to have that positive reinforcement of, yeah, you've tried is fantastic. Um, I understand that it's hard to always find the time to be available or you know, virtually on call all the time during week 13. Um, but I know that the lecturers who have, you know, taken the time out of their day to be available as much as they can are always appreciated. I think lecturers that aren't um, always available, I know lots of other lecturers have lots of other commitments as well. Um, I've always appreciated lecturers who have taken the time to prepare answers to their past exams, which they can give out. Um, normally, Lecturers are a little bit reluctant to do this because they believe that students will pass them on to friends and things like that, and I do understand that perspective, but if I've taken the time to scan you my exam answer and you've looked through it, provided feedback and said, here's what I expect for a HD answer, it's just really invaluable to me because I can look at that and say, this is what the person who is marking my exam is expecting, 
this is the standard I can live up to, and or try to at least, and then I can go through. So for example, last semester I had a teacher who was willing to do that, and I would go through the exam again myself, and then say, okay, did I get all of the issues there? And look at the exam answer that he'd written, and say, yep, 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 okay, miss that one again, really need to work on identifying, you know, um, legal professional privilege, so I'll go back and I'll redo this again in my next exam answer. So I think that that was really beneficial. Um, and in my opinion, the best lecturers in exam week are those who don't necessarily require students to come in for face-to-face -face feedback all the time. Um, I think that it's a tribute to, to lecturers who recognise that students are much more on the go these days. Some students choose to go home, which is in different states during study week, just because it's easier for them to study. And I think that it's very difficult when, when lecturers are only happy to provide um, feedback on exam answers in person. Um, you know, I do understand that they're really worried about students passing those exam answers on, but I think that students who are just going to look at the answer and say, oh yeah, I could do that, they're really only hurting themselves, and the students who are going to take the initiative and um, learn from that properly are the students that really deserve it and don't deserve to be penalised. Um, finally, my last point is outdoor learning. So this is a new initiative from the Office of Learning and Teaching and I just wanted to mention it because it was mentioned in the video as well and many students, more than I thought would, I, I confess, um, responded really positively to it and I think that Bond has a beautiful campus and I know that we're investing in a lot of new infrastructure for outdoor learning and I think it would be great if we could see all of the lecturers, tutors, whoever just really embrace this, all of the academics embrace this um, moving forward because I know that it's something that I think is really innovative and could be a real pull factor um, for Bond in the future. So um, yeah, I just think it would be great to see. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, we have time for one question for Jessica. I'll also remind people that at the end of the session, there are uh, any time left, we'll be open for questions. Any questions? Okay. Next up, uh, Avi. Thank you. Um, that was great, Jessica. I'm not prepared whatsoever. I guess you can call me unlike Jessica. I'm a typical student. Um, again, I'm in my fourth semester, uh, the JD program, studying law why I chose Bond. Um, it's a two-year program as opposed to three back home. Um, like in the video, this architecture, just everything here, um, it's amazing. I mean, compared to my undergrad or where I went to school back home, this place is a palace, so I can't complain. Um, again, over here, there are a lot of Canadians, so it's like a home away from home kind of thing. Um, I don't feel like I've even left Canada, to be honest. Um, Diversity, again, is awesome. I mean, people here are from all over the map, from Germany, China, Sri Lanka, um, you name it, Canada, America, so that's positive. I've made a lot of new Aussie friends. Uh, Jessica, you are my friend, right? Yeah, so, and um, the transition back home, I don't think it's gonna be a problem. Uh, to be completely honest, I live in Vancouver, BC, and I do know a lot of Bond alumni. In fact, before I even chose to come to Bond, I have talked and spoke with a lot of Bond alumni, and they all have their own respective uh, practices in law. In fact, they're doing better than the Canadians back home who went to a Canadian law school. Uh, yeah, they don't like us very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, some improvements. Um, in class, we have a mix of undergrad and postgrad students, but I swear it's kind of like a high school or like an elementary dance where you have girls on one side and boys on the other side. But in this case, it's just the undergrads on one side, and then you got the postgrads on the other. Um, one suggestion that I have is perhaps in the tutorials, um, just mix it up. Just have a mix of undergrad and postgrad students. Um, we're all going to be writing our own different exams, so it's not a big deal, I think. Um, another improvement, I think, um, that can possibly be made is that uh, professors over here have a lot of real life experience. And I think that's very important to share to the students. I'll give you a great example. Uh, my father's a developer back home in Vancouver. So after taking land, I thought I knew everything about caveats and mortgages and stuff like that. So I'm like, hey, dad, I mean, um, that guy is totally screwing you over. And um, uh, you can totally file a caveat or you can do whatever you want, dad. It's no problem. You have an equitable interest, whatever it is. My dad's like, it's not that easy. I'm like, what do you mean it's not that easy? I just learned about it. And he goes like, trust me, what you learn in school is, does not really happen in real life. So uh, I tagged along with my dad to his lawyer, and it's true. It's not what you do in real life. It's, it's a bit different. I am sure professors all know this, 
but it's uh, good to mention right off the bat so we're not surprised when we enter the real world what's going to happen. Um, but otherwise, um, like I said, uh, extracurricular uh, activities, um, awesome, basketball, badminton, beach, volleyball. Um, yeah, like I said, I live in Vancouver, so um, Vancouver for a reason because um, you can't do anything. It's, it's just wet. Um, so yeah, I was just here to answer questions, to be honest. So if you guys have any questions, I'm more than uh, uh, willing to answer them. Thanks. All right, thank you. Are there any questions at this point? And feel free to shout them out. Yeah, don't be shy. <laughs> I have a question. Um, and anyone can answer this. What characteristics would you list under an amazing teacher? And then what characteristics would you uh, list under a teacher who you would rather not have? And why? <laughs> Well, personally, uh, to have a passionate teacher is my number one thing. If you can see that your professor is, you know, vibrant and just really enjoys teaching and enjoys the subject. Like, I don't know if you know this, but it, you can really, really tell if you're sitting there and like listening every week for, was it 14, 12 weeks? You can really tell what teachers want to be there and who's only there to collect the paycheck. <laughs> okay. But in a nice way. Any other ideas? Passion is really important. I suppose uh, my word I would say is friendly. I mean, it sort of sounds a bit cliche, but it just makes the classroom environment so much more engaging. I think we saw it in the video earlier when Danny made a comment about being called Danny in his classroom. I think you don't have to be best friends with your students, but like being someone beyond being just there to convey information to them, I think is very important for people engaging with the subject. Actually enjoying the subject. Okay, great. I think um, communicating the, the parts, the parts of the subject that you're most knowledgeable on. So I'm going to like single someone out. I had David Field for evidence last semester, and I absolutely enjoyed my entire time with him. He's got this great sense of dry humour, and he's he's not afraid to kind of display that in lectures, which made that entertaining. Um, even with not the whole class thought his jokes were funny. Um, <laughs> he thought they were, so that's okay. And um, and he's just really responsive, so more than happy to respond to emails. You know, um, I remember being really flustered before one tutorial and just emailing saying, David, I don't understand this and it's really bothering me. And he just said, Jessica, why don't you come to the tutorial and see what you've actually got wrong first and then I'll discuss it with you. So just kind of keeping a cool head and understanding that sometimes students do get flustered and we don't have, you know, all of these life perspective and <coughs> our tutorials are really, really important to us and stuff like that. Um, and just kind of keeping it real, that's great. Thank you. Um, any I ideas or views on the other side? Because uh, there are always pros and cons. Um. I think it's great to see lecture lecturers who do more than read off the lecture slides. Um, going to a little bit more depth than the lecture slides is, is great to see. Um, I've had a couple of lecturers who just come in, read the lecture slides, go home, and it's not engaging and I could just sit at home and read the lecture slides myself. And I think um, Bond wants better and Bond students want, want more. Okay, thank you. All right, and we're at uh, 3.30, so next up is, is it Fideli? Fideli, yeah. Fideli, sorry. <laughs> yeah, most people can't pronounce my name even in Sweden, so it's fine. Um, yeah, I'm Fidley and I'm from Sweden and also the international liaison of BUSA, as mentioned before. Uh, I actually just finished my uh, business degree and I majored in marketing communication and loved every second of it. Well, almost every second. Um, and the reason why I chose to come to Australia and travel for 28 hours um, was well, because, first of all, it's Australia. It's, it's pretty cool here. Uh, also, the fact that you could do your degree uh, in two years, uh, do your undergrad in two years. Like, I, I researched quite a bit of universities before I chose Bond, and no other university that, that I came across offered a two-year degree with that quality, which I think it's amazing. And I do know a lot of my international friends chose Bond for the same reason, that it's 
you can do it fast track. Like you invest so much in it as an international student and to commit for four years or three years, um, it is a big commitment to come for two years, but it doesn't feel as rough. Well, now I want to stay, so I'm going to stay longer anyways. Uh, but yeah, that was a big reason for me. Uh, and also, uh, the agents that Bond has around the world are amazing at their job. Um, just before I got, yeah, no, because uh, I met with an agent in Malmö in Sweden and didn't know what Bond was, didn't, never heard of it, still thought it was, you know, James Bond. Um, and <clears throat> anyways, so this agent, she's like, oh, you know, like, you seem like an ambitious person, like, you are going, you want to travel, have a look at Bond, and obviously fell in love straight away and left two months later. Um, so yeah, that's Bond, why Bond? Uh, and then when I got here, um, Obviously, as most people, I enjoy the small classes. And again, from an international perspective, it's really, really good to have that. And it becomes such a security. I mean, especially your first semester, you get here and you talk like this because you have a really broken English. Uh, and it's just really great then to have, you know, that personal relationship with your lectures and with your tutors and they, like, they're, you understand that they're actually really there for you and it's so valuable when you come to a different country and you're in a new culture and you don't know anyone and just to have that, I don't know, have that group of people that you can see actually cares. Um, it's really, really good. And then mentioned before, passionate teachers, just the amount of passion, it's great. I know that passion is probably not the right word, but we, we get there, yeah. Um, open door policy. I touched on it before, and it's, it's again, really, really good. Uh, and then another thing is the international population we have at Bond. I think it's over 30%, 36% or something like that, international students. And it's just such a cool, such a cool thing that you can stay on campus and you can be here on this little area and you can create a network for yourself for like the entire world. If I were to go travel anywhere, I would go after graduation, I would know someone on that continent. And it's a pretty cool, unique, you know, opportunity that you get from Bond that you don't really get anywhere else. Um, and, oh yeah, I forgot to say this before, but as well as being international, I'm also dyslexic, so I just have everything going for me. Um, and uh, it was actually student learning support here at Bond that picked up on it. Like, obviously I knew that yeah, reading is not great, and my spelling is not always, you know, on point. Uh, but it was student learning support that picked up on it, and, you know, they were more like, you know, Fidley, like, maybe you want to go and check it out. Like, just see what it is. Uh, so they sent me to the um, psychology uh, here at Bond. Uh, they did some tests, and it turned out I was dyslexic. At 20 years old, nobody had picked up on this until I got to Bond. That's pretty... Well done, Bond. Um, and leading into this, also the disabil disability office, such great support from them, and um, especially around exam times and stuff like that, they always make sure to prepare you beforehand. Uh, and they, I know that they also send out uh, emails to my lectures that I have, um, so they know that you know, you have a student that a little bit special in your class, uh, and the teacher, like some of my lecturers, actually approach me when they get this email, and they're like, "So, Philly, just to let you know, like, if you need anything else, or if you know, if you're struggling with something, please just come to me." And um, as as a dyslexic, that is really, really valuable, just to know that you don't have to come to them and be like, "This is, I'm really, really struggling," but that it's actually them coming to you. So. If you ever have a student with dyslexia, just side note. Um, and um, yeah, and then going back on a little bit of construct constructive criticism, uh, group work. Yeah, full stop. No, uh, I've had 24 classes at Bond and I've had 48, 48 group works. That's two group works per class. Not really, but it's a lot, a lot of group work, and I do see why you need to have group work, and I, I can see that it's important that you learn to collaborate with other people, and you need to learn the team dynamics and all of this, and that part is great, but <laughs> 
you, you're always going to end up in groups where either you're the one that has to do it all or you have someone that doesn't do anything or you occasionally you get those groups where you get that one person that doesn't want to collaborate with anyone and just does the whole thing themselves uh, or you hand something in and they changed it all and then you get graded on something that you actually did not even see. Um, it's, I don't know, I get that you need to do need to learn to work with others, be prepared for the real world and all of this, but when you pay that much money and you get graded on something that someone else did, uh, or you get graded on, you, you do something for someone else, so they get a great grade, but they did actually not do anything, it's not, it's not a great feeling. And it usually also takes a lot more time when you have to do, when you have to do group work rather than if you just did it yourself. And it, I don't know, the, I'm sure you've all heard this a million times before, but it's, yeah, group work could be less of it. Um, but yeah, I guess that's my only constructive criticism, so yay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? The, the topic of group work is often, often debated, so. Any questions? Yes, I care. So, in terms of group work, would you feel, and I know because I've been a student as well and had a similar experience, and yeah. it is very up and down, but trying to navigate it from the lecturer's viewpoint as to what is fair, mm. would it be better to have peer assessment where you're reviewing each other within the group and also possibly if it's a big project and often they are mm. very big Yeah, absolutely. I think that if you're doing peer review, you definitely need to do the checkpoint as well, because you will get, you know, you meet some, you get into a group with someone, and then you get in a fight, and it's not a fair peer review. Uh, well, I guess that is just a little thing, but I think that it definitely helps with peer reviews. I think it's a necessity. I think you definitely need to have peer reviews if you're doing group work. Um, and I think that checkpoints is another good idea. But just to, I don't know, because since it's so big, the group works are usually so big, and we all know that it's easy for two students to leave it till the night before. It's, it's a good thing to have checkpoints, I guess. try to ride on other people's coattails and unfortunately they do exist everywhere um, because you have those people who you say oh okay I've delegated this to you how's it going Joe oh it's going great Jess I've, I've done all of this that sounds fantastic um, and so you've been checking in with them and they've been saying that they've been doing this work but you don't actually get that work and when until 3 3 a.m. the night before and when you do get it it's nothing like anything they've described so I think that the checking points are uh, like definitely a good idea, yeah. Mm. Absolutely. And, yeah, I just had one thing to add on that as well. I think the preemptive nature of it is a good idea because there's a lot of students that maybe they are contributing to their group but they're still one required members mm -hmm. of the group and they want to say something about a person that's being quite overbearing um, and perhaps not doing work but saying they're doing work or they're sort of stepping on everyone else's toes but they don't have the confidence to go forward to you to actually tell you that. Um, like obviously the students at the other end that are very quickly going to say what their problems are within the group, but it gives a person an opportunity to be quiet and to actually have a forum where they're forced to actually share what their views are on the group. Okay, great. Thanks for the ideas. Any other comments before we move on? We're right on time, so that's good to see. Uh, Jessica. Hi everyone, um, it was mentioned before I'm the Academic Affairs Director, I'm on the Health Science and Medicine Students Association um, and I'm in my final semester of Biomedical Science. Um, I started at Bond in semester 132 and I moved from Adelaide and found the transition a lot easier than expected. Um, I think it was to do with the community-like feel, it was 
It was easy to make friends and especially um, starting my degree on campus um, made such a big difference because I could meet new people so easily and um, I was able to make friends in my corridor. Um, I f also think the on-campus living, it really encourages you to get involved in student life. Um, I definitely believe that it's a big part of what makes um, Bond and the people you're surrounded by feel like a tight-knit community. Um, the facilities at Bond, I've always found them exceptional. Um, we've got so many study spaces that are amazing. The library, the MLC, the Bat Labs. Um, you can always find somewhere to go. So I think that's great. Um, adding on with that is the sporting facilities that we have available for us. Um, someone like myself, I love playing sport and I enjoy going to the gym. So it's a good release. Um, while you're studying. Um, so personally, studying biomedical science, I spend most of my time in the HSM faculty building. Um, and I think that it's, it's great that we have all of our classes in one building. Um, it allows us to meet everyone in our cohort. Um, more so, we meet people in other programs. So we can speak to people from sport and exercise. We can speak to people that are studying um, doing their research or studying medicine. Um, and that's great for someone like me and all the other people in my degree. We're at the same point now where we're coming to the end of our degree and we're not sure where we're heading. Um, and if we need a backup plan, we can talk to these students and we can get their advice and get their feedback. Um, the lab facilities are amazing. Anatomy labs, the physiology labs. Um, we also run PBLs, which are problem problem-based learning in our tutorials and it's a really great practical way of learning so we'll get a case and um, so someone has diabetes but you're not told you just get their sy symptoms um, and you work through that and I think that's a really great way of learning um, <coughs> another thing that being in that building during breaks we can study together and we have our own computer lab so that's a really good advantage for us um, studying at Bond in general, uh, in regards to being different from other schools, obviously it's been said many times, the small class sizes. Um, for us, we have lecturers for, the same lecturers for multiple subjects. Um, so now in my last semester, I know all of my <laughs> lecturers, I know all of my tutors, and it's really great, um, they know my learning style, they know how I am as a student, how other students um, like to learn. Um, yeah, the personal relationship is, is really beneficial. Uh, their open door policy, it's, it's great to be able to have a problem and send a teacher an email and you get them replying to say, oh, th these are my free times, come in we'll talk through it and that's happened to me many times and it is such a big help to be able to go and speak to these, um, these lecturers and get help from them. Um, the reason I decided to study at Bond, uh, the academic opportunity, um, it's diverse, we have a unique community which I think is amazing. Um, another reason is that studying biomedical science at Bond it's, it allows us a number of pathways at the end. Um, we're not stuck with one thing. So I would like to study medicine and it's great because Bond actually offer people who have finished their biomedical science degree, they offer us um, to apply for second year medicine at Bond. So we skip first year because we've, learnt, we've spent two years in biomed um, and we can go straight into second year. Um, which, I, not that I know, I don't think any other unis give their students that opportunity that I know of. Um, as well, I can, as a backup, I can get into research and I do my honours here, so that's another pathway that I can undertake. Um, in terms of workload, um, we do get a heavy workload, but in saying that, the lecturers are always there to help, so it's, it is tough, but it's, we're not left in the dark. And for example, 
Um, I have friends that study at the University of Adelaide and they will be six weeks into their semester and have no idea what they're doing. Um, they won't get guidelines on assi assignments and um, on their content, what they're studying, but we have help in that area. We can come and see you. Um, so thank you. <laughs> Uh, I also think that um, constructive feedback that you give is really, really helpful for us. Um, yeah, sorry, that was my only point. Um, extracurricular activities at Bond are also a really good opportunity to get involved. Um, the societies and clubs are offered, I think there are over a hundred of them, and they can suit any type of person. They're catered for every individual. Um, for example, I got involved with the Red Cross Society uh, last year and went to the Angel's Kitchen and that was a great opportunity. I, I met other students from other degrees, which I don't get to do a lot of um, because we are in our own little faculty. So that was that's a really nice way to meet people. Um, we also have the opportunity to get onto our FSA, our Faculty Student Association. That's been a really great experience. Um, it's taught me leadership skills. It's um, taught me how to interact with people and work well with people, um, how to resolve conflicts. So that's been really helpful. Um, one constructive criticism that I would have, um, it's more so based at the uh, HSM faculty, is that we don't really have exchanges promoted to us. Um, I'm not sure if it's because it's harder for us to go on exchange, but um, I would have liked to go on exchange, but I wasn't sure that that option was available for me. So um, I think that's one thing that students would be interested in doing is an exchange, um, whether they're studying anything in the health science faculty. Um, I think that would be a really good opportunity to have during your university life. Um, and lastly, the teachers here, the academics, you're all amazing help. You, um, you always go out of your way to help us and um, the consultation hours are really helpful. Um, not only do you help us with our subject work, um, but you also help us with giving life advice. So. I've been going to see my lecturers about what I'm doing next year. Um, for example, one of my lecturers walked past me the other day in the hall and said, what are you doing next year? And I just looked at him and said, I have no idea yet. And he said, OK, we need to have a chat. So it's, that is really great to have that relationship with your lecturers. Um, yeah, that's it from me. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Jessica. Are there any questions at this point for Jessica? followed by tutorials. So a big class, 120 people by a whole series of tutorials, maybe 15 people. And we went to a seminar format. So all of our classes, you know, could be around 40 people. How do you feel about that change? Is that still, is that within your parameters of small class? I mean, we still take it upon ourselves to try to learn the student's name. But 40 is not 15, but it's less than 100. That is true. Um, I have had a few classes where there are up to 40 students in my lecture. Um, it's, I would still call that a small class size. Um, from what I know from other unis, you have classes that are almost 200 people in them. So, um, and I think that the lecturers, they, they go out of their way to um, know every individual. So. I'm, yeah, I don't have a problem with, I think a class of 40 is still a good size. I think as well as it depends on the nature of the subject. Oh, okay. Yeah, it depends on the uh, nature of the subject, I reckon. Um, I don't know if it's a law subject, maybe. I've had one law subject, business law. Uh, then it definitely requires the tutorial and, you know, when you need to 
sit and interact. And I've had a couple of um, advertising classes where um, it's also super interactive and the tutorial is more of a conversation rather than the lecturer talking to you or the teacher tutor talking to you. So, and for me, that was, I valued that a lot and that those three classes that had that structure uh, have been my three favorite ones just because it was more of a conversation and I guess that's the way I learn. Uh, so, yeah, depends, I reckon. Thank you, Ron. Okay, so I prepared some slides, which is probably against what my whole presentation is uh, directed towards. But um, and I might stand up because I thought I'd be able to see the screen, but I can't from here. So I'm going to stand over here in the corner. So I suppose a little bit about me, which gives a background to why I chose to talk on this particular topic. Um, I'm towards the end of my degree. Uh, this is my last semester of four years. And the key message I really wanted to get across is that I'm quite a tactile learner. I learn best when I'm put in a situation and I have to discover it for myself and uh, really learn by doing. So that's why my presentation is about experiential learning. Um, my definition of this, which is, may not be consistent with what the OLT office uh, would define it as, this is my lay term, but basically it's teaching in any situation where I'm doing. So for me it might not necessarily be um, a hands-on activity where you're uh, actually doing a negotiation or you're doing a moot or something like that. It might be something as simple as trying to find the answer for myself. So where I'm doing my own independent research to try and um, uncover information, for me that sort of fits into this experiential category. Um, what I'm going to do with my presentation is basically work through three instances in my degree where I've had this hands-on experience and then analyse what elements coming out of that really assisted me to learn the content for that subject. So I'm going to have a, uh, a look at land law from the um, laws program, also an elective I took in the laws program and then a business subject. So for me and my experience with Bond, I suppose uh, the gold standard in doing what you're actually learning is the Bond's law skills program. Um, I know there was an earlier session on it, I'm not sure uh, how familiar academics from other faculties are with what the program involves, but basically every core law subject has a skill attached to it. Um, and that varies from subject to subject, and some of them are more closely connected with the content than others, but it means that by the end of the degree we've done pretty much everything that you would have the opportunity to do in practice. It involves simulated courtroom activities, negotiations, client interviews, as well as drafting. And to focus down on one of those particular uh, instances, I took land law uh, a year ago now, so this semester back in 2014. And in that particular um, subject, what you have to do is negotiate over a lease. It's a three-party negotiation, so a bit more complex um, than the previous time you do a negotiation in the program. But I think one of the elements that was best in the delivery pre-doing the negotiation uh, was the way that the instructor taught everybody to negotiate in the first place. And so each of the skills have a skills lecture on Friday whereby you learn what you have to do before you actually have to put it in practice. Um, in this particular uh, instance, the lecturer gets six senior students or um, students that have been in a course before and actually has them do a live demonstration of a negotiation before you then go to simulate the negotiation yourself in a week's time for assessment. Um, and I think whilst that's not necessarily experiential learning, it does give the students in the room who are learning to negotiate the opportunity to as close as they can be a part of that negotiation before they've actually had an opportunity to develop the skills to do it themselves. And so the instructor will give um, the students in the room the opportunity to sort of pause the negotiation and comment um, on something that one of the senior students has done in the demonstration. And so it also gives them the opportunity to manipulate how that negotiation is working. And so the instructor might say um, that the students need to do a um, highly positional based negotiation whereby they're not really focusing on the interests in the parties. And so the students learning uh, in the, the, the skills lecture actually have the opportunity to see before they do the uh, experience themselves how the dynamics can change. And I think um, to comment on this particular element of the skills program, 
I don't think it makes a difference whether the experience is accessible or not accessible. Out of the three um, examples that I'm going to talk about, two are very assessment focused and that um, does put a different slant on it, I suppose, for some students, but then also experiential learning outside of the accessible space is also a, a vital tool in the classroom. The next one I wanted to talk about was my experience in international commercial arbitration. Now, this was um, very different to a lot of other circumstances um, and subjects I've been involved in because it wasn't intensive. Um, it was a visiting professor uh, who delivered the content over two weekend series of uh, lectures. And so in the first uh, week six, we had three days worth of content. So that was your traditional uh, lecture scenario. There was only seven students in the course, um, but it was delivered like a lecture. We went through slides, we went through a packet of information, and basically learned all the background knowledge we needed to know for uh, using in an international commercial arbitration. However, then the classroom was flipped for the week nine experience, and what we did was actually uh, three different moots, so we're broken into teams and broken into different roles within uh, this simulated arbitration, and basically had to put in practice pretty much everything we learnt in the course, starting from the very top about arbitrability right through to looking at the, uh, the merits of the case. But what was particularly interesting about this uh, situation is that the students actually filled all the roles within the arbitration. So some students were actually judges on the bench and other students were counsel. And what the lecturer would do would base, we had to um, preemptively hand in submissions so that we'd, we'd done the research and we knew what we were talking about. We weren't just dropped into the scenario. But um, basically what would happen is the lecturer would walk around and if you'd missed something in your submission or if the judge had failed to ask a question to counsel, then he'd just jump in and be the ghost counsel or the ghost judge and basically ask that question to himself. And sometimes it became him having a discussion with himself from the bench to the mooters, um, whereby he was answering and asking his own questions. But because we were in that unique environment whereby we were actually emulating a moot, it just felt different and it felt like you were um, engaging a lot more with the content that he was delivering, even though for some of it, it really was almost the same as a lecture. And so I think what I took from that particular uh, course was just a unique style of engaging with the content which really brought it uh, forward in my mind and made it clearer to understand for me. The final one that I want to talk about is when it's a non-accessible experiential uh, learning process. And this is a subject I'm currently taking, negotiation uh, in the business school. And basically, the first thing I've got written up there is that the students are expected to pre-read the content. And I know that's always going to be a challenge. Um, a lot of students don't pre-read their content. And I know that's probably no surprise to a lot of lecturers. And so sometimes that requires the lecturer to do a small work around where a brief component of the important elements are pre-lectured before the simulations are run. But in this class, basically what we do is every week we simulate a negotiation that focuses on the particular elements that we're learning uh, in that part of the course. So it might be value creation or it might be uh, growing um, value. And all of the individual uh, scenarios are then debriefed. And I think this is another critical part uh, of experiential learning, the debrief component whereby if you've missed something in the simulation, then you can pick it up later by listening to other students. And for me, this is one of my most enjoyable subjects because it's hands-on, I don't get bored. I'm someone who sort of probably sits at the back and falls asleep when it's just normal lecturing content because I'm not engaged with it. And I learn best in these kind of situations and it's something that I know a lot of students do. So I suppose my takeaway from this is a lot of students, particularly undergraduates coming out of high school, are used to these kind of teaching methods. Throughout high school, most of what they've done has probably been more hands-on than a typical lecture scenario. And so Bond is in a unique position to be able to exploit that. A lot of other universities don't have the opportunity to uh, really have that, because of the small size, that hands-on experience that we do have here. And I know it means a lot of my friends at other universities get bored so easily in classrooms. Um, obviously, I'm speaking only from my experience. I know there's a lot of it within the medicine cohort, that hands-on approach. But I think it's something that we need to not lose sight of and really um, continue to build upon. It doesn't need to be forced in courses because I know sometimes when you feel like this is a really forced uh, trying to fit a hands-on approach into a um, course, it's not as, as, as involved. So it's not a fit-all model, but it is absolutely crucial, I think, to learning at Bond. Um, and it's something that I really wanted to highlight. Thank you. Thank you.